and dearly beloved in the hearts of Jesus and Mary. Divine Providence has all through the ages of human history singled out certain chosen souls for special tasks not entrusted to others, not even to otherwise truly brilliant or holy men. And in His infinite wisdom, the Most High has seen fit to endow such persons with uh, the extraordinary gifts of mind and heart needed to fulfill His Most Holy Will. The pages of the Old Testament already provide us with outstanding examples of God's careful selection of His chosen ones. For example, Abraham, Moses, David, the prophets, Judith, Esther, the Maccabees, and many others. While the history of the Catholic Church sparkles with the illustrious names of the great ones of God, such as the Twelve Apostles, the Fathers of the Early Church, doctors and theologians, missionaries, orators, founders of religious orders and congregations, and so on almost without end. Among the great ones of Christian times there are those who were supernaturally enlightened and inspired to explain and to defend, sometimes even single-handedly, some particular truth of the faith either against heretics or even against otherwise outstanding doctors and theologians to whom, mysteriously enough, the divine truth in question was not yet clear. The sad is that select theologians, using the gifts given to them by the Most High, have defended also the glories of the Immaculate Virgin Mary, who is herself among creatures, the chosen one of all generations. John Dun Scotus, simply Franciscan theologian and philosopher of the late 13th and the early 14th centuries, was called by God to unravel the mystery of the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary and to defend it fearlessly at a very time when most theologians were either firmly convinced that the Holy Virgin was definitely conceived in original sin, just as all other human beings, although admitting that she was cleansed from original sin before birth, or they held to this erroneous view, perhaps reluctantly, because they were at a loss to understand how it could have been otherwise. God raised up John Duns, the Scotsman, and that is what the Latin word Scotus means, the Scotsman. God raised him up to explain clearly, for the first time in the history of the Church, how the Immaculate Conception of Our Lady was not only possible and probable, but in reality a divinely revealed fact. This great Franciscan, who is not as well known as he deserves, thus prepared the way for the eventual proclamation of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception by the saintly Pope Pius IX five and a half centuries later, that is, on December the 8th, 1854. It is unfortunate that so much misinformation and also outright lack of information has beclouded the well-merited glory of Dun Scotus, as he is familiarly called. But that has been the fate, at least for a time, of various saints and other favored souls, and especially of those who have defended the divine, divinely given glory of the Mother of God. Thus, for example, St. Thomas Aquinas, later known as the Prince of Theologians, was not immediately given the recognition that he deserved as a teacher of the faith, but came into his own much later, and other similar examples could be given. There now exist various reliable sources of information on John Dun Scotus, and his writings have been appearing for some time in a definitive edition although these are mainly for the benefit of scholars. But there is at least one book of well over 300 pages 
It was written by a French Canadian Franciscan for the ordinary person, and it is entitled John Dun Scotus, a Teacher for Our Times, published in 1955 by the Franciscan Institute of St. Bonaventure University near Buffalo, New York. Since Duns Curtis lived well over six centuries ago, it is not surprising that precise details about his life are often missing. We come across this sort of thing often in the lives of the saints, especially of the older saints. As his name Scotus indicates, which means a Scotsman, as we have already said, John Duns was born in Scotland. He was born in the late in late 1265 or in early 1266, not far from the town of Maxton on the Tweed River in the lowlands of southern Scotland, which were an agricultural region. His father, Ninian Duns, who was a kind of gentleman farmer, owned a country estate called Little Dean, which was two miles downstream from the town of Maxton. Historians have never found out what his mother's name was, although they have rightly concluded that she must have been a truly devout woman, since her son John was so devout and so highly favored by God. In his boyhood days, John Duns, being the son of a farmer, spent considerable time tending sheep and cows in the pastures and meadows of Little Dean. This type of occupation is said to have fitted in very well with his naturally contemplative soul, for it afforded him solitude and much time for devout prayer in God's open country. Since we are speaking of a favorite of the Immaculate Virgin, we should mention that an old tradition among Franciscans has held that the devout shepherd boy and mini cowboy was once engaged in, in prayer while tending his flock and he fell into an ecstasy, such as is common among many of the saints. During this ecstasy, the Blessed Virgin, all glorious with heavenly beauty, appeared to him and revealed to him a secret that referred somehow to his later life, but this secret has never been revealed. But young John Duns did not remain a shepherd for too long. For his elementary education, he was sent away to Haddington, some distance from home, which is said to have been the principal town in southern Scotland in those days. In Haddington, he came under the direct influence of the Franciscans, who had a monastery and a house of studies there. And this was undoubtedly a contributing factor leading him to join the Franciscans later on. There were other influences that could have led John Duns to the contemplative life of a monk instead of to the life of a Franciscan friar. The fact is that the little dean estate of John, uh, the John Dun of the Duns family was, as it were, surrounded by abbeys or monasteries of monks of different religious orders. Four of the most famous abbeys of Scotland were located in that area. <coughs> the best known of these was the Cistercian Abbey of Melrose, where the heart of King Robert Bruce was laid to rest after his assassination in John Dunn's own lifetime, that is, around the year 1306. This Cistercian Abbey of Melrose is said to have been the center of Marian devotion in Scotland until Presbyterianism swept over Scotland over 300 years later. It was also of the later ruins of Melrose Abbey that Sir Walter Scott wrote in his Lay of the Last Minstrel. 
The other three abbeys that gave Little Dean almost a monastic atmosphere belonged to the Benedictines, the Premonstratensians of St. Norbert, called also the Norbertines, and the canons regular of St. Augustine, who gave St. Anthony of Padua his start in Lisbon before he became a Franciscan. But despite all this monastic atmosphere, which must have appealed to a soul like that of John Duns, he nevertheless followed God's call to the more active and apostolic life of a Franciscan friar or a friar minor. As it was, an uncle of his, Father Elias Dunce, was a Franciscan, and an important one too, for none other than the King of Scotland himself, Alexander III, appointed him to direct and promote religion in his kingdom. Besides this, the Dunce clan is known to have had close connections with the Franciscans for a long time and to have donated property to them on more than one occasion. John Duns entered the Order of Friars Minor in 1280 at the age of 15 at the Franciscan novitiate of Dumfries in southwestern Scotland. A year later, on Christmas Day of 1281, he gave himself to God forever by pronouncing his solemn vows in the chapel whose sanctuary was desecrated 25 years later in 1306 by the assassination of King Robert Bruce. Since we have mentioned the great devotion of John Duns Scotus to the Blessed Virgin Mary and the vision he had in his boyhood days, we should also mention the fact that he had the greatest devotion to our Lord, and that it was this devotion to our Lord that made him honor his mother so highly, just as was the case with St. Francis himself. This fact is brought out in the vision which Friar John Duns had of the child Jesus in his early years as a Franciscan. It was on Christmas Day one year, that Friar John was favored with a vision of the Christ child, who was apparently a bit older than just a newborn infant. Friar John had a great desire to hold the child in his arms. The child told him that he was Christ who was born today. Then the Christ child embraced and kissed the young Franciscan friar and disappeared. Before his ordination to the Holy Priesthood, Friar John Duns received his philosophical and theological training at several different places, at Haddington in Scotland, at the famed University of Oxford in England, and at the University of Paris, where he was destined to achieve his greatest glory as champion of the Immaculate Conception. Only that was to come later. Surprisingly enough for something that happened so long ago, there are exact details about the ordination of John Duns Scotus. He was ordained a priest of God by Bishop Oliver Sutton of the Diocese of Lincoln in England on March 17, 1291, in the chapel of the Benedictine Monastery of St. Andrew in Northampton. With him, twenty others were ordained to the Holy Priesthood. Young John Duns had given indications of future intellectual greatness already as a schoolboy at Haddington. And now, sometime after his ordination to the Holy Priesthood, his intellectual brilliance prompted his superiors to send him back to the University of Paris for higher studies leading to the doctorate in sacred theology. For the next 12 years or so, he was destined to commute, so to speak, between Paris and Oxford several times. So in 1297, after about uh, four years at the University of Paris, 
which was in the height of his glory as an institution of learning, he was back at Oxford, where he received his Bachelor of Arts and also began his rather brief but brilliant teaching career. While in Oxford, he is said to have done some teaching also at Cambridge. In 1301, he was at the University of Paris for the third time as a Franciscan, and this time, while studying for his doctorate degree, he was promoted to the rank of a professor. His stay at Paris was interrupted because of the bitter controversy that broke out between Pope Boniface VIII and King Philip the Fair of France, and about which one can read in books on church history. It happened that at the University of Paris, the professors and others were obliged to declare themselves, whether for the king or for the pope. While 65 sided with the king, 87 sided with the pope, and one of these 87 was his father, John Duns Scotus. Because of this, it was found advisable that he leave France, and that is why he came to Oxford once again. Pope Boniface VIII, who suffered much indignity at the hands of the king's representatives, died within a year. Whether it was safe for him or not, Duns Scotus now returned to the University of Paris, that is, about the year 1304. That was to be his last stay in Paris, in a career that was rapidly approaching a glorious climax for this great theologian of the Immaculate Conception. In 1305, after 12 years of study and teaching, he was awarded the doctorate at the University of Paris, which had some years before been honored by such great doctors of the church teaching there as St. Thomas Aquinas, a Dominican, and St. Saint Bonaventure, a Franciscan. Both at Oxford and at Paris, John Duns Scotus had gradually acquired considerable fame as a teacher, and he was greatly sought and admired by many, though he did have his enemies. His teaching enabled him to develop the admirable doctrines for which he is greatly respected in properly informed circles of the world of theology and philosophy. His unusually keen mind and his profound depth of perception earned for him the very complimentary title of the subtle doctor. And the word subtle in this case is not to be understood as meaning tricky or mysterious, as is so often the case today, but rather implied a very profound mind. But another and more illustrious title, the Marian Doctor, was given to him, especially because of his stand in favor of the Immaculate Conception, which could not but attract attention even among the representatives of the Holy See. It is well to make clear that John Duns Scotus exalted Our Lady and promoted her glory as much as he possibly could because he understood the exalted glory of her divine Son, who was the whole reason for Mary's sublime position above men and angels. Duns Scotus did not promote the glory of Mary independently of Christ. He looked upon Immaculate Mary only in the light of Christ, whom he knew to be the crowning glory of all creation, and in his human nature, the highest and noblest of all creatures, or as St. Paul expressed it, the firstborn of every creature. Then Scotus looked upon Christ both as God and as man, as the king of the universe, and he is considered to be one of the greatest promoters of the kingship of Christ. 
It is only because of the greatness of Christ, the universal king, that John Dunscotus understood why his mother should have been so highly elevated as to be preserved from every stain of sin, even from the stain of original sin. Christ, the king of the universe, was his inspiration in defending the immaculate conception of Our Lady. But as a defender of the Immaculate Conception, John Dunsquittis stood in a rather lonesome position. About the only ones that we know of who agreed with him were a couple of fellow Franciscans, one being Blessed Raymond Lull, a Spaniard whose feast on the Franciscan liturgical calendar was long observed on July the 4th, while the other one was one of Dun Scotus's teachers at the University of Oxford, the Franciscan William of Ware, Ware being a small town about 20 miles from London. These two men, Blessed Raymond Law and William of Ware, sometimes call, are sometimes called the forerunners of Dun Scotus as defenders of the Immaculate Conception. It is one of the strange realities of life that a man like John Dunscotus was actually suspected of heresy in defending the Immaculate Conception of Our Lady, although his numerous opponents at the University of Paris were really the ones who held a position that eventually proved to be heretical because they denied the Immaculate Conception. But that is the way the enemy of the woman of Genesis and of the woman of the Apocalypse turns things completely around, causing his unsuspecting victims to look upon truth as error and upon error as truth. How well we know this from personal experience in our own times when modernists and progressives and liberals, the tools of Satan, promote so many errors in faith and morals as the end thing, and they thus deceive their blind followers. What is especially amazing is the fact that for almost 200 years before the time of Duns Scotus, from the time of St. Bernard of Clairvaux to St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Bonaventure, theologians were whether willingly or unwillingly, predominantly, predominantly in favor of the view that the Virgin Mary was not conceived immaculate. The great Cistercian St. Bernard of Clairvaux, who died in 1153, was otherwise intensely devoted to Our Lady, and yet he very strongly criticized the canons of the Cathedral of Lyons in eastern France for daring to introduce the Feast of the Conception of Mary, which he considered to be an unlooked-for innovation, and in even a juvenile frivolity, as he himself called it. The Dominican St. Thomas Aquinas and the Franciscan St. Bonaventure both died in 1274, when John Duns Scotus was about six or seven years old, and both had taught with great success at the same University of Paris where we now find Duns Scotus, but neither of them understood nor taught the Immaculate Conception as a fact, though they were not as strongly against it as was St. Bernard of Clairvaux. We are unable to say why the Most High God withheld the grace of enlightenment regarding the Immaculate Conception from so many great teachers of the faith, some of whom we now honor as canonized saints. While it pleased him to give that grace of enlightenment to a man who, though a brilliant teacher, is not, for some mysterious reason unknown to us, as yet a canonized saint. 
The same Paul exclaimed, writing to the Roman, Who hath known the mind of the Lord? The fact of the Immaculate Conception of Our Lady is a divinely revealed truth, which in God's own secret design was hidden away in the sacred deposit of faith from the beginning. The Immaculate Conception was implied in the teachings of the Fathers of the Church who spoke of the total sinlessness of the Virgin Mary, but they never analyzed this truth so as to understand just what was meant by it. When the doctors and theologians of the Middle Ages did begin to analyze the Immaculate Conception, they could not understand how it could be reconciled with other truths of the faith. And these other truths of the faith were principally two that seemed to stand in the way of any immaculate conception. First, the universality of original sin. Then, secondly, especially the universality of the redemption. By the universality of original sin we mean that all men, without any exception, were thought to have been conceived in original sin, the Virgin Mary included. By the universality of the redemption, we mean that all men, without any exception, were redeemed by Christ the Redeemer. The theologian knew very well the divinely revealed fact that death has passed unto all men, because all men have sinned, as St. Paul wrote to the faithful of ancient Rome. To the theologians, this revealed fact made any immaculate conception for Mary impossible. It did not seem to occur to them that God could have made an exception with the Virgin Mary. But John Duns Curtis explained, first of all, that the Virgin Mary, as a child of Adam, should have contracted the stain of original sin. And furthermore, she definitely would have been conceived in original sin if God had not intervened. In this way, Duns Scotus broke right through the difficulty by showing how the law of original sin still applied to Mary, but he was not afraid to consider the possibility that God could prevent that law from taking its effect in the Virgin Mary. The fact is that Almighty God did intervene in Mary's case and he did prevent her from being stained by original sin. This he did, of course, out of consideration for his eternal son, who was destined to be born of Mary, and he desired for his son an absolutely and totally sinless mother. As for the second difficulty, that is, the universality of the redemption, Theologian knew that Jesus Christ was the Redeemer of all men, or as St. Paul expressed it in his first epistle to Timothy, He is Savior of all men. They could not see Mary as an exception to this law, and they wrongly thought that the Immaculate Conception would make her an exception. But here again, John Duns Curtis explained even more brilliantly how Jesus Christ is Mary's Redeemer, just as much as He is our Redeemer. Only her redemption took place in a different way than ours did. He showed that the Virgin Mary is no exception to the law of redemption. Duns Curtis went about it in this way. He explained that Jesus Christ is not only the Redeemer, but that He is the most perfect Redeemer, because He is able to redeem in a more perfect way than just by cleansing from sin. He is able to redeem someone 
by preventing him from falling into sin. The most logical person to deserve such a favor from the Redeemer would naturally be his own mother, the Virgin Mary. It was the will of God that Mary should be redeemed in this more perfect way, that is, by an act of prevention. And this is Duns Scotus's famous doctrine of pre-redemption. Mary was pre-redeemed. That is, she was redeemed ahead of time, before the actual act of redemption took place on Calvary. The graces of the redemption were given to Mary beforehand, or by anticipation. And this was done already at the very first moment of her existence or at the moment of her conception, which means that she was conceived immaculate. The daring stand of young John Dunn Scotus in favor of the immaculate conception, despite enormous opposition, led eventually to a solemn convocation in the University of Paris Auditorium at Easter time in April of the year 1307. Duns Scotus, standing all alone, was obliged to defend his views in favor of the Immaculate Conception before a large gathering of very important persons, and he won a resounding victory by refuting all arguments against the Immaculate Conception of Our Lady. The result was that practically the whole University of Paris henceforth, henceforth accepted the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, and eventually all the professors there were strictly forbidden to teach that Mary was conceived in original sin. Over 450 years later, an historian not favorable to Duns Scotus was the first to cast doubts about that glorious event of the year 1307 in the University of Paris Auditorium, saying that it, it never really happened because so many of the earlier historians were silent about it. But the fact has been solidly established and no one can reasonably deny that the event really took place. There have been some doubts expressed about some of the details of Duns Scotus' Paris victory for Our Lady, but of the fact itself there is now no doubt. One of the details that has been doubted even by those promoting the cause of John Duns Scotus is a miracle that is said to have taken place just before the great confrontation in the Paris University Auditorium. On his way to the packed University Auditorium, Duns Scotus stopped before a statue of Our Lady and begged for her help in the trying ordeal he was about to undergo. Vouchsafe that I may praise thee O oh, Holy Virgin, he, said to have, he is said to have prayed to her, Give me strength against thine enemies. The words of this prayer have long been adopted by the Church in certain prayers and hymns to the Blessed Mother. The statue of the Virgin suddenly came to life, as, for example, the statue of Our Lady of Victory is dead for centuries of Lisieux, many centuries later. And Our Lady nodded approvingly with her head, indicating that she would help John Duns Scotus. When the statue returned to normal, the head of Our Lady nevertheless remained slightly bowed as it was when she nodded to Duns Scotus. It is one of those strange contradictions that this incredible, uh, entirely, this, this entirely credible incident, so worthy of God and of Our Lady, is rejected because of the silence of earlier historians, 
are the very same persons who insist that the silence of earlier historians is no proof that Duns Scotus is, did not really win that great victory for Our Lady in 1307 in the University of Paris Auditorium. John Duns Scotus was not exactly a persona grata in the political circles of France because he had sided with the Pope and against the King a few years before his Paris victory. He was more famous than ever because of that victory, and this may not have been too pleasing to the king, whose representatives were said to have been present for that grand occasion. Whether or not this was a contributing factor in his transfer from France, the fact nevertheless is that Father John Duns Scotus was suddenly, and without explanation, ordered by his superiors to go to Cologne, Germany, only a couple of months after his successful defense of the Immaculate Conception. He has said uh, when he received the orders of the superiors, he simply took his bravery and walked out of the monastery and headed for Cologne. In Cologne, he resumed his teaching career. But in the designs of the Most High, his thy divinely assigned work on earth was finished. God called the great doctor of the Immaculate Conception to his eternal reward in the following year, in the year 1308, on November the 8th. His holy remains rest in Cologne, but they, though they were endangered by the bombings of World War II. May the Lord bless you and give you peace.